But um, as we come to the end of Black History Month, uh, we should remember that 50 years ago this week, there was a riot in Los Angeles, California in the black community. 50 years ago, just this past weekend, was the assassination of one of our most famous leaders, Malcolm X, on February 21st, 1965, at the Audubon Ballroom. And 50 years ago, next month, will be the celebration of the march from Montgomery to Selma. And what's interesting about that march is that it was to pass the voting rights bill in, later in 1965. And if there is a need for Black History Month and a need for celebration, but also a need for action, I simply ask this question. Do you think that the current House of Representatives and Senate could pass the same Voting Rights Act that got passed 50 years ago? Well, then we have taken a giant step backwards. And now what we're really doing is fighting to preserve the rights that many of those who we celebrate during this month fought for. Now, how did we get in this position? Maybe we got there because we're not teaching enough black history. We're not learning enough about our communities. And we're not borrowing enough from the Jewish communities whose moniker is never again. So let's start right now. Um, I really um, am a fan of Commissioner Bratton. I must say, I like the way he reaches out. I love the way he came here today and the fact that he answered uh, the questions that he, that he did. And I have some sympathy for the police department. I'm sorry he didn't hang around to hear this, but I think the police department has always been put in a difficult situation since the original relationships that existed in our communities because the relationship between the black community and the rest of the city was always unequal. It was a relationship of tenant to landlord, of consumer to shop owner, of artist to agent, of patient to doctor, of student to teacher, of recipient to caseworker. And after all the discrimination and the results of poor housing, substance abuse, crime, unemployment, and underemployment, poor and adequate health care facilities, and a failed education system, who got sent in to keep order but the police department? People who didn't live in the community, people whose perceptions of the community were totally the opposite than the way they were, people who were trained to feel about people in our communities differently than they felt about people in other communities. And is there any surprise that some of them, not all of them, but some of them manifested these attitudes into brutality. And in those years, police brutality was systemic. I'm not saying it is now, but it certainly was then. We, uh, in our family, Hazel included, lost my dad last year. He lived to the age of 87. And more than missing him now, I appreciate that he lived to 87 and not 86. Because something happened in his last year that really shocked me, and it was after the acquittal in the Trayvon Martin case, when he was making the point that as horrible as it is for humanity, how uh, heart-wrenching it was for the family, that verdict by that jury might be a call to action to our communities. And in the process of discussing this, he raised an issue in front of the family that at least my brother and I had never heard that at the age of 16 in 1942, walking home from <clears throat> playing stickball, he was asked by a police officer where he got the baseball glove from. <clears throat> he told him, <clears throat> excuse me, that he was coming home from playing stickball, and he was then, in front of 20 people, pistol whipped by a New York City police officer. The NAACP came to see his family. And they sat down with his father and mother. And they said, we want to bring a case against the New York City Police Department. And his parents told the NACP, if you do, who's going to protect our son? 
Because in those days, there would have been immediate ramifications for anyone who tried to stand up to this inhuman treatment that went on in these communities. So when you think about the uh, situation that um, Commissioner Bratton raised also 50 years ago, in 1965, when a 15-year-old student named James Powell was not only shot and killed by a captain, uh, Lieutenant Thomas Gilligan of the New York City Police Department, but when he lay prostate on the ground, the, the lieutenant kicked the body and rolled it over to see if he was still alive. That's what prompted six days of rioting in Harlem and Bedford Stuyvesant. And the excuses that we would get for why it was the victim's fault, like right here in Queens, all the way back in 1973, when a 10-year-old child was shot by the police, uh, his name was, was Clifford Glover, when he was walking his stepfather to work, and the media accounts uh, dealt more with why he was walking his stepfather to work than why he got shot. And I won't go through all the names, but believe me, I know them, of the cases uh, that have existed from Clifford Glover to Randolph Evans, a seven-year-old who got shot in 1978 by a police officer in Brooklyn, and his excuse was a psychiatric um, analysis that wasn't even approved by the American Psychiatric Association, and he was acquitted. So this is the reason that there's so much feeling. And while I would say that community policing is shared responsibility, justice is not shared responsibility, because I don't think people in the community can be held responsible for the acts that were committed against them. So, um, with that, I accept this award. <laughs>